As knowledge concerning your mind's true essence blossoms and blooms within your heart, the end of the long road of suffering will gradually come into view. A portent of Tamma. Walking through the nunnery's entrance in the looming dusk, Mechi Gao proceeded quickly to her small bamboo hut. She needed time alone, time to digest the day's traumatic events. But the familiar space inside the hut felt oddly different now, as though she were suddenly a stranger in her own house. As night slowly settled in around her pensive mood, the moon and stars appeared dimmer and less welcoming than before. Shaken and uncomfortably unsure of herself, Mechi Gao sensed an urgent need to make amends. Reflecting on her predicament, Mechi Gao eventually realized that a John Mahabua had a legitimate reason for driving her away. She had deliberately refused to heed his advice or make any efforts to change. The more deeply she pondered, the more clearly she understood that her own conceited attitude was to blame. He obviously had a good reason for disapproving her style of meditation and pointing her in a different direction. But why couldn't she accept his teaching? She had really gotten nowhere by willfully resisting his advice in deference to her own selfish indulgence. What if she were to simply do what he told her to do? She should at least try, instead of always stubbornly refusing. Seeing her mistake, she reproached herself. You accepted him as your teacher, so why can't you accept what he teaches? Just do what he says and you'll know for yourself the truth of his teaching. As dawn approached, the fog of uncertainty began to clear, and she decided she must quickly redeem herself. She would force her mind to succumb to the teaching and willingly accept the consequences. The next morning, shortly after the meal, Merchi Gao excused herself from the regular duties and immediately retired to her hut. With a sense of grave urgency, she seated herself in meditation, intending to force her awareness to remain strictly within the confines of her body and mind. She was determined to prevent her mind from focusing outward to become involved with any external phenomena whatsoever. She had perceived ghosts and devas and other disembodied spirits for so long that they no longer held special significance for her. Every time she focused her attention outward in meditation, she encountered non-physical beings. Although she saw non-physical beings in the same way that other people see with their physical eyes, Mechi Gao had never gained any real benefit from that ability. The defilements constantly polluting her mind remained unaffected. Only by concentrating inward and closely observing the movement of her conscious mind could she understand those mental impurities and overcome their influence. Fully accepting this principle, she focused her attention solely on the internal recitation of Buddha and continued until all thoughts ceased and her flow of consciousness converged into single-minded concentration deep within her heart. Using the full powers of her newly found resolve, she maintained the focus there until her entire physical body vanished from awareness and her mind went absolutely still. Withdrawing slightly from deep samadhi, she immediately saw another vision. This time, the vision was a portent of Tamma. Opening her inner eye, she saw Ajahn Mahabua walking toward her, carrying in his hand a radiant, razor-sharp knife. Pointing the knife directly at her body, he announced that he was going to demonstrate the proper way to investigate the physical body. With that, he began to methodically chop her body to pieces. Slashing repeatedly with the sharp knife, he dismembered her whole body, cutting it into smaller and smaller fragments. Mechi Gao stared transfixed as body parts fell to the ground around her. She watched as Ajahn Mahabua dissected each part further until nothing remained of her body except a disjointed heap of flesh, bones, and sinews. Addressing her internal awareness, Ajahn Mahabua asked, Which piece is a person? Look at them all. Compare them. Which piece is a woman? Which is a man? Which one is attractive? Which one is desirable? At that point, she was faced with a bloody mess of body parts. They were so disgusting in nature that she was totally dismayed to think that she had clung to them for so long. She continued watching as the remains of her body were scattered about until, finally, nothing remained. 
At that moment, her mind felt drawn back inside, and the flow of her consciousness decisively reversed direction, dropping to the base of samadhi and converging to the very center of her being. Only a simple and harmonious awareness remained, alone on its own. The knowing essence of mind was so exceedingly refined as to be indescribable. It simply knew. A profoundly subtle state of inner awareness pervaded. By decisively reversing her focus inward, Mei Gao halted the normal flow of consciousness and realized the true essence of mind, the very essence or source of awareness. Within the heart's central chamber, she experienced an ungraspable sense of vast space, beyond measure, the wondrous nature of the formless essence of awareness. When focusing inward, she suddenly forgot the focusing and entered utter quiescence. Not a single thought arose. Everything was empty silence. Body and mind were in a state of great freedom, and all objects, including her body, disappeared without a trace. Utterly tranquil, her mind stayed for many hours bathed in its own solitude. As soon as her mind began withdrawing from deep samadhi, she detected a subtle movement of consciousness, almost imperceptible at first, as it started to flow out from the mind's essence and move away from the center. As the momentum of consciousness grew, she clearly observed a strong and immediate urge for the mind to turn its attention outward in the direction of external perceptions. The tendency was so much a part of her nature that she had hardly noticed it before. Suddenly this conscious outflow stood out clearly against the background of the serene tranquility of the mind's true essence. In order to reverse the normal course of consciousness and keep her awareness firmly centered inside, she was forced to put up a mighty struggle against its outflowing inclination. She thought of Ajahn Mahabua and reflected on his severe admonitions. Now certain that he was right, she renewed her resolve to rein in her mind's wayward tendencies. During the next several days, Mei Gao concentrated on finding a reliable method for firmly anchoring her awareness inside. Emerging from deep samadhi, she clearly comprehended the challenge of controlling the mind's outward flow and refused to allow its impulsive movement to take over and drag away her attention. The mind's outflowing movement was always accompanied by the activities of thought and imagination. That flowing, revolving consciousness created and maintained the entire sentient universe but when not a single thought arose, spontaneous mindfulness was born. Being a moment of pure attention, this awareness of the present was alert but relaxed. It did not fall into the elements of body and mind, where material and spiritual illusions took charge. In the past, upon withdrawing from samadhi, all sorts of images appeared in her awareness for no apparent reason, enticing her mind in their direction. She felt she could not turn them away if she wanted to, and even felt comfortable going along with them. When the mind stayed unified until pure mindfulness arose, she witnessed the moment-to-moment -moment creation and cessation of a myriad of thoughts and images while remaining detached and dispassionate. Having witnessed the essential transformation of focused awareness, she realized the value of receiving the guidance of a true teacher. When she felt confident that she could effectively reverse her mind's dynamic flow by unifying it and keeping it grounded in the present, she decided to risk Ajahn Mahabua's displeasure and return to Nok An Cave so she could respectfully relate her progress in meditation. When she arrived at the cave, she was met by Ajahn Mahabua's stern, unwelcoming countenance. Why have you come here? he barked. I told you to stay away. This is no place for a great sage. She pleaded with him to let her speak, to listen to what she had to say. She explained that the traumatic experience of being chased away had caused her to accept her faults and take seriously his advice to focus inward. In precise detail, she described the new direction of her meditation and how she had learned to maintain detached presence of mind. She knew she had been wrong to value her misguided knowledge of spiritual phenomena, which she now realized had gotten her nowhere. She had worked hard for several days discovering how to control her mind's dynamic tendencies until she finally succeeded in keeping it solidly centered inside. With immense gratitude and a sense of accomplishment, she had returned to pay homage to her teacher and humbly ask for his forgiveness. 
Only those who practice meditation can truly understand the spiritual path. But learning meditation properly requires the guidance of a gifted teacher. The teacher cannot afford to make even the slightest mistake, especially when his disciple is meditating at a very high level. The teacher must know more than the disciple so that she can respectfully follow his lead. It is wrong for a teacher to teach above his level of understanding. The disciple will not benefit from such instruction. When a teaching is based on direct experience of the truth, gained through penetrating insight, a talented disciple will be able to progress very quickly along the path of wisdom. Seeing that her meditation was now firmly on the right path, Ajahn Mahabua graciously accepted her back. He told her that she had been living with the ghosts of her mind for too long. Compulsively following the flow of her conscious mind had caused her to live at the mercy of ghosts and spirits, and to be a slave to the phantoms created by her own mind. By turning the flow of consciousness back on itself, she temporarily interrupted its momentum and restored the mind to its essence. What she experienced was the true essence of mind, the mind's intrinsic knowing nature. Consciousness is a function of the mind's essence, but conscious activity is transient and lacks the mind's intrinsic quality of awareness. States of consciousness exist in conjunction with the awareness that knows them, and the knowing essence of mind is the very root and source of that awareness. The transient states of mind that arise and cease within the flow of consciousness are merely conditioned phenomena. Because the mind's essence is conditioned by nothing, it is the only stable reality. Consciousness naturally flows out from the mind's essence, moving from the center of the mind to the surface. Surface consciousness constantly changes form, shape, and substance as it is rippled by the shifting winds of greed, anger, and delusion. But the true essence of mind exhibits no activities and manifests no conditions. Being pure awareness, it simply knows. The activities that spring from mind essence, such as awareness of the material world or the spiritual world, are conditions of the consciousness that emanates from the mind. Since consciousness represents mental activities and conditions that are, by their very nature, constantly arising and ceasing, conscious awareness is always unstable and unreliable. When the outward flow of consciousness intersects with the perceptual fields of the sensory organs, awareness becomes mixed up with the objects of its perceptions. When consciousness intersects with the eyes, sight conditions consciousness, and consciousness becomes seeing. When consciousness intersects with the ears, sound conditions consciousness, and consciousness becomes hearing, and so forth. Therefore, when sense consciousness arises, the essence of mind is obscured and cannot be found. It is not that the essence has disappeared, but that its knowing nature has been transmuted into consciousness. Ordinarily, when people allow their eyes and ears to pursue sights and sounds, they become emotionally involved with what they perceive, calming down only when those sense objects are gone, becoming obsessed with the endless parade of ghosts and spirits in the ordinary conscious mind, they completely miss the mind's true essence. By reversing the flow of consciousness, thoughts are interrupted and brought to a halt. When thought ceases, consciousness converges inside, merging into the mind's knowing essence. With persistent practice, this foundation becomes unshakable in all circumstances. Then, even when the mind withdraws from deep samadhi, it still feels solid and compact, as though nothing can disturb the mind's inward focus. While samadhi does not bring an end to suffering, it does constitute an ideal platform from which to launch an all-out assault on the mental defilements that cause suffering. Observation becomes spontaneous and instinctive, and mindfulness remains fully present. This sharp and immediate focus complements the investigative and contemplative work of wisdom. The profound calm and concentration generated by samadhi becomes an excellent basis for the development of penetrative insight into the nature of existence. There are two main objectives for bringing thought to a halt. One is to open up space to clarify the nature of thought by distinguishing compulsive and habitual thinking from deliberate and focused thinking. The other is to clear room for the conscious operation of non-conceptual insight. Both are indispensable aspects of wisdom. Properly practiced, samadhi can stop thought temporarily, but it does not distort reason. It enables one to think deliberately rather than compulsively. This use of mind opens a wider space for thought, with the ability to think and observe with detached clarity. Direct perception can see at a glance where a train of thought will lead. Using independent and intuitive insight, 
One can put down useless thoughts and take up useful ones, thus building a firm basis for transcendent wisdom. As long as the mind has not reached supreme quiet, it cannot properly think. Thinking caused by the ongoing momentum of consciousness is random thinking, not essential thinking. Knowledge gained from conceptual thought is superficial and unreliable. It lacks the essential insight of true wisdom. A mind undistracted by peripheral thoughts and emotions focuses exclusively on its field of awareness and investigates the phenomena arising there in the light of truth, without interference from guesswork or speculation. This is an important principle. The investigation proceeds smoothly with fluency and skill. Never distracted or misled by conjecture, genuine wisdom investigates, contemplates, and understands at a deeply profound level. Because Mei Chi Gao had been bound up with the products of consciousness for so long, and thus alienated from its essence, it was necessary for her to directly experience the mind's true essence. But experiencing the essence was a means rather than an end, a means of freeing the mind from gross mental hindrances and laying a solid foundation for further development. Ajahn Mahabua warned her that the experience of mind essence could easily lead her to a false sense of confidence in the knowledge arising from conscious perceptions. This made it imperative that everything flowing from the mind be investigated carefully. Each time that she withdrew from deep samadhi, it was necessary to examine the activities of consciousness for the remaining taints of compulsive mental conditioning, ruled by lingering attachments to physical form, mental imagery, and thought formation. In this way, Ajahn Mahabua taught Mechi Gao how to probe deeper into her mind so that she could learn to completely uproot the mental defilements that were wrapped tightly around her heart. He reiterated that this, and not the perception of countless phenomena in the conventional world, was the essence of Buddhist practice. He urged her to first turn her mental energy towards solving the enigma of physical embodiment and the mind's inevitable attachment to form. He reminded her that the practice of wisdom begins with the human body, the objective being to directly penetrate the body's true nature. In investigating the body, he taught her to make use of the power of spontaneous observation as a contemplative technique. So as to avoid falling into conditioned patterns of thinking, based on habitual interpretations and fueled by conjecture and supposition, Mechi Gao must employ the clear, unclouded mindfulness present right where consciousness emerged from the mind's true essence. For spontaneous insight to arise, the limitations of ordinary thinking and imagining must be overcome. That meant perceiving the objects of investigation just as they appeared in her mind, all at once, without conceptualizing. If she allowed the conscious mind to discriminate, by naming and labeling mental formations, then normal mundane conditioning would generate a proliferation of thought and lead to profuse confusion, the very antithesis of true insight. By spontaneously observing phenomena with clear mindfulness, she could develop a sense of freedom from the things she perceived and attain wisdom's natural, unobstructed clarity.